extremely excited to have Lee Walker on this episode. Lee, a professional stenographer of 24 years, has been a real-time freelance reporter for the last eight years in South Florida. Lee is currently updating her first reference book, Words That Make You Go Mmm. This book is to guide stenographers on proper hyphen usage. Hey, Lee, are you ready to go on the record? Let's do this thing. Awesome. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Well, I'm not afraid to share my age, so I will say I am 49 years old. And as you've mentioned, I've been doing this for 24 years and I've, you know, loved every minute and had some down times, as I think we all do. But nothing can deter me from staying with stenography because it's just the love of my life. And so when did this love start? When did you start school and what school did you go to? The love started when I first saw the machine. I was working at a law firm when I was 18 years old and in came this very attractive girl in beautiful clothes, dragging a little machine behind her, a little scooter behind her. And I guided her into the conference room and she started setting up and she pulled out her machine and I immediately just gravitated towards it and uh, I asked her what it was and she explained it to me. She was very enthusiastic. And when I left my office that day, the first thing I did was went to the yellow pages because that's what we did back then and found a court reporting school and enrolled right away. What school was that? Where was it? It was in West Palm Beach, and it was called Court Reporting Careers, and the owner was John Ross. His daughter is currently a court reporter in the community, and I'm still friendly with her and see her at the courthouse, and I love her to pieces. I loved her dad to pieces. Then from there, uh, he retired and the school closed. So I moved to Cooper Academy where I graduated in 1994. Did you have to change theories when you changed schools? I did not because I was in the upper speeds. I was in about 160 when I switched. So it was more practice at that point, more speed, increasing my speed. So it was easy. It was an easy transition. What theory did you learn? Stened. You made a briefs book based on Stened. Is that right? Yes, that's how it started out. When I learned my theory, it was supposed to be a conflict-free theory, but it really wasn't. I still had a lot of conflicts I wanted to work through. So based on the basics of Sten Ed, I ended up learning how to break apart my conflicts on my own, and uh, it worked beautifully. So it inspired me to share those briefs in a book called Book of Bottomless Briefs, and that's available on Amazon. When you had to transition schools, did that slow you down at all? Did it slow down your graduation time? How did you make that transition? It actually did slow it down a little bit because the curriculum at Cooper Academy had a little bit more uh, academic courses. So I had to catch up on those, but I whipped through them pretty quickly because medical is my strong point. And with the legal classes, I had already been working at law firms for four and five years before that. So I had a lot of knowledge in that class that sped the process up to just whip through the classes. So I had no problems at all. Overall, how long did it take you to graduate from start to finish? Well, (laughs) I went to school at night. I worked a full-time job at a law firm from 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. I would grab a quick bite and go to school three nights a week. And then I had a part-time job on the weekend. So I was very motivated, very driven, and I worked really hard. Plus, I had to work in all that practice time. I was 24-7. All total, and I took a year in between. I took a year off in between. So total from start to finish was five years. I was very, very adamant about getting that certificate of completion because it wasn't a degree at that school. Once you finished with school, you obviously decided to get certified. What made you decide to get certified? At that time, I was wide-eyed and, you know, excited to get out in the world and be a professional. And I obtained my RPR pretty quickly after finishing school. And then as time went on, I realized it wasn't getting me any more work and I was busy as could be. So I let that RPR lapse. And then fast forward to 2010, when I went complete freelancing, I decided to get my RPR again, because as I was calling around to put my name on lists at different agencies, they would always ask me, do you have your RPR? And even though it isn't required, it is sort of a badge of honor to say I have my RPR. I don't do it to prove to myself that I can do it because I already know I can do it. It's to prove to the world that I can do it. 
and that they can at least have faith in the credentials behind my name that I'm qualified to cover their assignments and take care of their clients in a professional way. At what point in your career did you get serious about becoming a real-time reporter? When I decided to go complete freelancing, which was in 2010, I'm a very motivated self-starter. So I focused first on my writing and breaking apart my conflicts and cleaning it up and getting it down to a very low untranslate rate. Once I did that, I wanted to start trying my hand at having people look at my screen. So I bought one iPad and I started using them on interpreter depots. And I would let the interpreter use the iPad if she needed, a, she or he needed a read back. They could just look at the screen. And it gave me that comfort level where the testimony was slow enough with an interpreter that I could felt I could handle it and not be too nervous and provide a tool. The attorneys were impressed by it. The interpreters loved it. And I got to practice. It worked out well. And then from there, you just have to be brave and take the leap and take that first job and do the best you can. You said when you went completely freelance, what was it about going completely freelance that you felt you needed to start providing real time? I felt that I wanted to maximize my income stream in every way. So that was having access to more agencies and having access to more services to be able to provide to the clients. Basically, you made yourself more valuable. Absolutely, 100%. Speaking of value, let's talk about the most lucrative assignment you've had as a real-timer. And can tell us about that and how much did you make? What was the case about? Give us all the details. It was an employment case. It was an employee of an international cargo airline. There were three attorneys on the case and it started out with one attorney requesting real-time. The other two attorneys attorneys were so impressed by the real-time feed that they also wanted it. So I ended up gaining two more clients for the agency I was covering for, and I covered every depot on that case from start to finish. It was wonderful because they were a great group of people. My job dictionary was amazing. Every job was just better than the next. That one earned me about 15000 a month while it ran for about eight months. Yeah, we all wish we could have all those months every month. <laughs> Fifth, you said 15000 a month for Fifth, eight months? 15000 a month for eight months. Wow, that's incredible. Yes, it's possible. It's out there. And it sounds like that's, you know, you can snap your fingers and do that, but it does take effort. You have to really, really put effort into it and be focused, be a self-starter, be professional, invest yourself in yourself. That sounds like a really great case. Are all of them like that? Or has there ever been a time in your real-time career that things haven't been so great? Take us to what you would call your worst moment as a real-timer. I honestly can't say that I've had a worse time where it was a complete disaster, which I find myself very lucky to say that. But there was one where I had a witness that was very, shall we say, high on the food chain, and he didn't like to be interrupted. And he spoke about 360 words a minute, and it was brutal, and it was an all-day job. And during one of the breaks, I said to the attorney, I feel like the real-time feed isn't bringing you value. And I feel like I shouldn't be charging you for the real-time feed. And I'd like to take it down. And he said, the real-time feed is absolutely beautiful. Please leave it. And on we went. You know, I think that story shows that we really are very tough on ourselves. If the attorney said that it's fine, it's great, it stays. I think that says a lot about your writing, but then also as we as stenographers, how sometimes we really could be very hard on ourselves. That is absolutely true. I agree with you. We are definitely hard on ourselves. And when I started a service called Stenolytics, which is a service to help reporters identify either trouble spots in their writing, helping them with conflict issues or other things that can help streamline their edit, their production, their uh, transcript production. In doing that, in working with these reporters, I see that their writing is much better than they have explained to me as before we started the service. You are absolutely correct in saying that we are very hard on our, much more hard on ourselves than we need to be. And uh, I think there's a lot of us that can handle real time that are out there not providing the service. 
I know you mentioned you have your brief book, The Book of Bottomless Briefs. Obviously, you're a brief queen of sorts, but do you also phrase... I do. Not like a Kislingberry phrasing. I do my own type of spin on my my phrases. It works for me because I can maneuver them to the way my brain works. As it relates to your writing, was there ever a time in in the last 25 years, 24 years since you started school that you felt, I don't know if I could really be a real-time reporter. I don't really know if I have what it takes. Did thoughts like that ever cross your mind? Yes, I graduated in 1994, and at that time, it was the hot time for real time. There were a lot of cables involved, and I am, was not techie at that point, and they intimidated me. All those wires intimidated me. I was I never thought I would be a real time writer. I said, no, 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 no. I don't want to do that. It's too scary. Absolutely not. And it was never because of my writing. It was more the technology. And it was just for lack of knowing and asking questions of how does that work and having someone make it easy for me, did I keep myself from doing it until 2010. So I really did myself a disservice by not even trying. And I would encourage everyone out there to at least give it a whirl and ask questions. Bring us to today. Are you practicing? Do you still practice? And if so, what's your practice routine like? I actually do not practice. I still, every single day on every job, am tweaking some kind of words. And I think that we all do as we go through our transitions and we see something new. Things change every single day, and that includes our writing. As far as practicing, no. But once I really buckle down because I want to take my CRR, that's my next goal, then I will really have a regimen and be practicing every single day. What is the best court reporting advice you have ever received? Well, I've always been a self-starter and I've always been pretty stubborn. So (laughs) if anybody's given me the best advice, I don't recall it right now because I always took the bull by the horns and just jumped on and rode the horse and just took off and did all my research. I asked questions of people I respected in the community and uh, lots of Googling. Thank God for Googling. What about for all the future real timers out there? What advice do you have for them? I would say just get started. The hardest thing is getting out of our own way. And I think we hold ourselves back way too much. So it's not as scary as it seems to be. Take it one step at a time, baby steps. You can't eat an elephant in one sitting. So one bite at a time. Well, thank you so much, Lee. This has been an amazing episode. You have given us so many tips and a lot of inspiration. I'm honored that you are a guest on the Lady Steno podcast. Thank you so much for having me and thank you for all the work you do and all the tips you share to all of us and you are invaluable. Thank you. Thank you. 